All right, let's get things going here. I'm going to introduce our first panel here. Again, this is Early Innovators, Big Ideas, and Crossing the Cyber Penny Gap. Our moderator is John Funge from Data Tribe. John, come on up, please. Please uh, join me in welcoming our, our panelists. John, you're going to be over here. Uh, and joining John is John Doyle from Cape Wireless. Another John. John, have a seat. And last but not least, uh, Anup Ghosh from ThreatMate. Welcome. And with that, uh, I'm going to ask all of you to go ahead and grab those microphones uh, so you can speak directly in them. Everyone here and in our streaming audience can listen to you. And with that, John, it's all yours. All right, Dave, thank you very much. Um, your voice is so familiar to me. It's like a family member. Um, I, I'm a daily listener to, uh, to CyberWire. Highly recommend it. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you to everybody for coming. Um, and uh, so I am John Funge. I'm with Data Tribe. Uh, we are a seed stage cybersecurity investor based in Maryland. Uh, we work very closely with founders through what we call fa a foundry model, uh, very hands on. Um, and before we go too far into things, I did also want to make sure to extend a thank you to, to Matt and his team and to Virtru. Um, uh, as well as to our, our tremendous uh, panelists who have each uh, very interesting career stories that we're going to get into a little bit in a second. Um, let me, I'm going to ask another question, you guys, by show of hands. Um, how many folks here are from the DMV, like grew up here? Okay, so that looks like maybe a third. So about two thirds of folks came here sometime in your career, maybe for family reasons, so on and so forth. Um, so let me just, there is a, a little bit of a story about Data Tribe, and it's relevant, I think, to the conversation I wanted to share with you as to wh why Data Tribe came here. Um, so the the start of Data Tribe really originates with one, you know, two of our founders that had a, a kind of meetings in mind, but one of them was a long time Silicon Valley based uh, cybersecurity investor, uh, Bob Ackerman, who had been investing out of the Bay Area for about 25 years, about as long as anybody has been doing it. He made this observation in his portfolio that some of the best companies, the highest performers, had founders out of the DMV, particularly out of the intelligence community, particularly the NSA. He was having a harder and harder time persuading these early stage founders to move west to build up their, their startups. And thus the idea, hey, why don't we move east there? Why don't we create a little island of founder-centric, operator-centric, highly supportive uh, VC that's just down the road from NSA headquarters? And, and that's essentially what we do uh, at Data Tribe. And it's, it's sort of centered on this idea of um, if you're gonna sort of drill for oil, drill where the oil is. And so we uh, we have a, a deep belief, and, and I think it's actually borne out in some of the industry statistics, that um, in fact, the, the oil being the talent, the fundamental unique talent that comes from uh, the fact that this area has uh, some of the world's biggest organizations that are institutionally established to be offensive at a nation state level. And that's a very unique, and and when you're looking for uh, unique minds sort of sets with regard to cyber, that's that's really key. In, it, in sort of thinking about today, I thought it would be useful to look at a few sort of DMV deal statistics. So I did a little bit of like mining through, um, through PitchBook. And there were a few stats that were pretty interesting that I came across. And, and um, so one of them is, and I think we all know this, that cybersecurity in general over the last 10 years has, has massively grown, right? So venture capital going into cyber is up one and a half X, and that's down from the big peak in like 21, 22. It's way down, but still up one and a half X from about 10 years ago. Um, that's number of deals. And the actual capital dollars is about two and a half times up. So it's just been growing. Now, here's the key thing about DMV and the fact that it's rising. So we as a, as a region have maintained both on a dollars basis and a deal basis, our share. So we roughly have the same share in this growing market. Uh, and that's, you sort of feel it. You can really feel it in the, and, and then within the DMV, Cyber is increasing, especially in the last couple of years, in part because the rest of venture has really pulled back, but cyber has remained strong. CBRE, the real estate firm, a couple months back came out with a really interesting report. On an absolute basis and on a relative basis, absolute basis, 
we have a dominant number of cybersecurity professionals in our regional ecosystem. When you normalize it for the number of people that live here, I mean, it's kind of astonishing that we have more people than like New York City when you compare the size of the populations. So we have a much, much deeper talent base in this area. And then lastly, McKinsey actually came up with some really interesting data where we do kind of to match point from before, we have um, a very... Uh, a, a very sort of strong position in terms of deals relative, but we're still pretty far behind the Bay Area in, in terms of just raw number of cyber deals. That said, we are actually number one in terms of kind of a hit rate, in terms of getting a yield on those, those venture-backed cyber companies to a meaningful M&A exit. We actually are doing a better job at yielding dollars of uh, exited dollars than the Bay Area on a kind of per deal basis. And so just some really interesting statistics that sort of speak to the the kind of truly uh, world-class nature of where we are. We are sitting in the deepest pool of cyber talent in the world. Um, and so enough from me, let's uh, let's sort of shift over and and hear, uh, hear the, the very interesting um, stories uh, that John and Anup have to, to share with us. So um, with, with that, what I would ask is if, if each of you could please just kind of share your journey, a little bit of your background so, so everyone knows kind of who you are and what, what you're doing both today as well as before. Share your journey and um, just a little bit like how did you end up in the DC area and, uh, and, and kind of give us a little bit of a helicopter tour across your different, um, you know, your different stops along the way. So why don't we start with you, John? Sure. Uh, thanks, John. Um, and thanks everybody uh, for the time and attention here today. Super excited to be at DMV Rising. Really cool, beautiful space. I think it's a little messed up that John, in this packed room, claimed a whole row of chairs to himself. And come. <laughs> He's like, hey, this is my office. I get this whole row. Um, so I'm, uh, I'm John Doyle. Um, I'm the CEO and founder of a company called Cape, based here in DC. Excuse me. We're a privacy and security focused mobile network, and I'm happy to talk more about that. Um, as we go, but my background uh, briefly is I was a computer science major. I was uh, Army Special Forces half a lifetime ago with the Special Forces group, went to Iraq. When I left the Army, I took a, a detour to law school and never practiced a day of law. Instead, I wound up at Palantir, uh, which is what brought me to DC to work out of DC office. I spent almost 10 years at Palantir, uh, started in technical roles, and then my sort of signature contribution to the company was the last, I spent the last five years, 2017 to 2022, running the intelligence community business for Palantir. Um, and there's a whole story to be told there as well. It's probably beyond the scope of my, my introduction. But uh, while I was doing that work, I learned about a problem that the intelligence community calls ubiquitous technical surveillance, UCS. Um, consumers call it privacy. It turns out to be a remarkably similar overlapping problem set. I got really passionate about defensive UTS vice offensive UTS, which is what we're doing at Palantir. Um, so how do we keep our people safe? How do we protect our people as they do their jobs? And it caused me to found Cape uh, almost two and a half years ago now. So um, within UTS, there's all these sub problems like facial recognition and online payments. The biggest hard hardest problem by far is mobile phones. So that's where we started. Um, I'm happy to talk at length about why we chose to build the network layer first, but now we're two and a half years into the journey. Um, Andreessen Horowitz uh, was our first check. They led our pre-seed round, Catherine Boyle and the American Dynamism Practice. We've raised $61 million in total to date, including a, a Series B here um, this last May. Um, and we remain DC based, although we have a New York office as well. Um, how's that for an intro, John? That's awesome. Okay, good. All right. Phenomenal, Duke. All right. Well, thanks for having me on the panel. Uh, good to be back here in DC. Uh, actually lived in DC for a little bit and then we moved out to uh, the Eastern Shore of Maryland. So I'm now a Maryland guy. Uh, glad to be uh, here on this panel. So my background, um, I uh, moved to the area, Northern Virginia back uh, in the late 90s, went to work for a cybersecurity firm called Sigital, which ultimately many, many decades later got acquired. Um, I then, uh, following 9-11, went to work for DOD in DARPA. So there's a there's a government connection there. Spent about four years doing offensive cybersecurity technologies, working in NSA spaces. Um, left there, started a company called Invincia. Um, at the time, it's known as Next Gen Endpoint, uh, ultimately EDR. Um, we sold that company to Sophos, which is uh, more of an SMB 
company based out of the UK, they uh, used our uh, technology in their endpoint product uh, called Intercept X now. A um, couple of detours there after, worked for a very large consulting firm, then ran another cybersecurity firm in this area as well. And then I started uh, my current company called ThreatMate. And we just launched it uh, almost a year ago now. Um, with a very small amount of money, you said you're 60 million in, I'm $1.4 million in. So uh, yeah, uh, not quite self-funded, but you know, almost there. So we focus on the SMB. SMB is an amazing space to sell in. I spent my career selling to the enterprise of Never Go Back. Uh, SMB is an amazing opportunity for those of you in the uh, cybersecurity space. Uh, it's a different good market. But uh, if you want to talk about high velocity sales, that's the place to be. So uh, we're, uh, we're getting off the ground, having tremendous traction and look forward to, uh, to launching another, another company. Very cool. Um, so both of you guys have very interesting backgrounds that have um, some rare things, rare, rare, you know, sort of uh, worked raised a lot of money, sort of have, have gone through the venture capital, have been through an m and um, have worked at one of the most, um, you know, kind of one of the most successful sort of Bay Area companies that's also made a lot of its uh, claim to fame doing a lot of government sort of, sort of business. I think one of the, the things that maybe is most uh, on people's minds in, in this ecosystem oftentimes um, are around two, two general topics, and I'd love your guys' perspectives on each of them, but we'll start with the first one. So there's a, there's a lot of people like to talk about dual use technologies and things like that. And, and um, sometimes we sort of look at that with a little bit of skepticism in part because what, what doesn't oftentimes get talked about is dual go to market. Okay. So you might have a technology that's useful in government applications and in commercial applications, but the go to market, particularly if you're a startup can be radically different. Now you guys have both kind of been on both sides of it. And I guess I'm just curious if, if each of you guys could sort of, you know, maybe, you know, John, tying it into your experiences with Palantir and into what you're doing now with Cape, can you sort of reflect on how that's in, impacted you maybe culturally and how you sort of think about it vis-a-vis -vis kind of, you know, your go-to-market and and Anut the same sort of your, your sort of track from, you know, Invincia through, you know, as through Accenture and Fidelis and now with ThreatMate. Yeah. John. Sure. Um, government go to market at Palantir. Um, you know, when we, I, I don't want to, I'm always careful not to give the illusion. I was like the, one of the first 10 employees at, at Palantir, but I joined relatively early in the company in 2013 when the product really didn't work. Nobody was really buying it yet. And there was a lot still to be figured out. And um, a big part of that was the government go to market strategy or the government go to market approach. And how do you do this? And how do you sell um, not $50 software licenses to the government, but $50 million software licenses to the government. Um, I don't <laughs> I don't know that we actually figured it out in a repeatable fashion, but I, the, the culture we built around it was, um, you know, you've got to have just like incredible diligence and incredible resilience if you want to, if you want to do business with the government, because it's hard and it's bureaucratic and it's frustrating and it's, and it's circular as well as cyclical and, and, uh, all the things that we all know to be so hard. And so the, the way we solved that at Palantir was by just recruiting people um, who were relentlessly optimistic and like a little bit half crazed and um, severely undercompensated and like selling them on the long-term vision of this company and the mission that we were serving. And if you could find people that would sign on despite all those challenges and all those like, um, <laughs> all your attempts to dissuade them from working at the company, then you found someone that might have a hope of competing, of completing the five-year sales cycle to become a program of record with DOD or land an enterprise deal with the FBI. Um, and so that, I think that was our starting point. We learned a bunch along the way and we, we sued our biggest customer, the army, and we won. And, um, you know, <laughs> um, I don't know if that's, I don't know if that's like the repeatable part, but it was, it was, important. <laughs> it was important in the moment and it turned out to be a good, it turned out to be the right call. Um, but you know, you know, along the way, we 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 had to figure this stuff out, and, and how do you convince the government to award programs of record to products and not to primes? And what does that look like? Um, I think that, and I don't, we were a part of that story. We're not the entire story. SpaceX has done amazing things on that front, 
Um, how I've translated that then into uh, Cape and a very early stage company solving a, a very hard set of problems is um, really starting back at the beginning and recruiting for it and recruiting for people who have the constitution, I think, to do it. Um, and then applying, uh, the thing we never did at Palantir that I'm trying to do at Cape differently is not be uh, automatically allergic to people that understand the dark arts of selling to the government. Like it's okay to have some insiders on your advisory board, right? It's, it's okay to have a couple of account executives that have done this a time or two before and they understand what a cyber is and they understand what these different, um, what all these different words mean. And so basically trying to keep the cultural, um, you know, the cultural advantage, but import just a little bit of knowledge to seed it with and hopefully go faster than whatever the, the 20 years it took Palantir to make any money. Yeah, I, I think you bring up a great point, John. It's not just dual use technology. Do you have the capacity, the focus and the funds to have a dual go to market strategy? I would argue most startups do not. It would be uh, too much for a startup to take on. Um, we ended up splitting that at Invincia into different divisions to kind of manage that risk. Uh, and we got our traction on the commercial side, not surprisingly. Um, at ThreatMate, we won't touch government. Um, it would just be foolish. I don't like five-year sales cycles. I like 30-day sales cycles. Um, so uh, would we eventually get there? Maybe. You know, I would say if we're big enough and have enough money uh, and enough, you know, we're solving a big enough problem that the U.S. government cares about, great. But I certainly wouldn't wouldn't go there in, anytime soon. So. Yeah, it strikes me. Um, your go to market right now is probably quite different than Invincia. And and so I'm I'm curious. So so just to kind of summarize, like as you continue to grow and get bigger at some point, maybe down the road when you have more resources so that you can endure the long sales cycle, it could be a possible segment that you look to go into. Yeah. In fact, I'm not sure we would ever sell direct to government. Um, if anything, we would sell to the contractors that support the U.S. government. And uh, frankly, to even get, I can't even get there today because of all the requirements to sell to them, such as having a FedRAMP certified cloud. You guys, you guys spent that money to do that. I, I did at my last company. It was outrageous. And, and the process is hard on top of it, right? So it's kind of like, no, I, I'll wait. Yeah. Yeah. And so, John, how much of your business with CAPE is, is sort of toward the government versus uh, commercial markets? Yeah. Um, our strategy, this is probably the question you asked the first time I didn't answer it. Um, our strategy has been to partner with the government in the first couple of years of the company, uh, to do R and D and find design partnerships in the pockets of users that experience the problems we're solving most directly. And so that's, uh, special operations folks, that's national security professionals. Um, and there are probably a lot of folks in this room are aware there are uh, bits and pieces of R and D funding that you can, that you can access relatively easily, certainly easier than the. In the big program dollars um, and that's been pretty successful uh we've done, spent two years doing that and been able to achieve our goals of partnering with the people that really understand the problem getting some proof points and validations from them getting some you know favorable reports and all the stuff that you need um now that we have a live network and we have a, a real product um that's in production we are uh adding uh, a go-to-market around high net worth individuals um and other secure sort of like tippy top uh, privacy and security conscious consumers. We have the advantage of selling the exactly the same product, right? Everyone uses their cell phone effectively the same way, the same way, send and receive calls and connect to the internet. Um, but what my prediction is to get to the point is um, that we will grow now the commercial part of the business significantly faster than the government part as we move from primarily R&D, RDT and E funding focused government um, revenue to programmatic spend. I think we're two to three years out from really meaningful programmatic spend still from the government. Got it, interesting. Um, so the other piece that I think is also super interesting with you guys is, is both of you have kind of raised pretty significant venture capital in your journey. Um, and so with CAPE, John, it, my sense is that you've most of your investors and, and funding have come from West Coast investors, uh, and then Anoop with Invincia, you I think you raised mostly local VC uh, VC funding. Can each of you guys just sort of share your what was your process and and how did you end up you know kind of doing it the way you did it and why and and what were some of your takeaways and lessons learned that you might share with with folks? 
Okay, I'll start. Um, yeah, so uh, I, I think as an entrepreneur, oftentimes sort of a, a batch of approvals having that venture round. And I, I think in a certain sense, it's the wrong badge of approval to look for. It just means you owe people a lot of money on an exit, right? It comes right off the top, right? And if you if you really stick East Coast, then, you know, you didn't. You know, you have this thing called preferences. God awful, right? Am I right, guys? Yeah. Right? Yes. Uh, so, um, look, my advice is raise as little as you need, right? Not to the point of stifling your growth, right? So our approach was to take the tactical risk off the table with friends and family money, right? So we we had friends and family fund our development. We took technical risk off the table to get to market with a product. Now, as we're raising venture, I'm really going to pour it on sales and marketing, right? To, to really scale it up. And I, you know, we'll see. Maybe I'll get invited back in a couple of years. Uh, I would love to come back and say, I only raised $3 million in venture capital and we blew this thing out, right? That to me is winning, right? Because that money goes back to the people who made it happen, right? Now, we need investors, which, by the way, your investors can be people you know, right? So don't, don't leave that, that network out there. I like operators in the space I'm selling to, right? So... Uh, people who really understand the space you're selling to you can make some of your best board members, right? Uh, so that that's sort of my lessons learned. Um, and we're getting we're bringing on board uh, a team from a venture uh, perspective who's heavily invested in, in the space we sell to, which is managed service providers, knows how to scale companies in that space. So we're excited about the talent they're going to bring to our company in terms of go to market. Um. Our funding story it really starts with, I think the, the most important takeaway is, is um, related but different. Is that CAPE's a super capital intensive business, like building a cell phone network just costs a lot of money, especially because none of us knew telco when we started. So we made and just to be clear, is CAPE, is CAPE a, a MVNO or is it, yeah. are you building your, are you facilities based telco? Uh, well, we're both. So we, we recently became a facilities MNO. That's such a good. Uh, deep cut question, John. That's it. Um, we're, we're an MVNO, a mobile virtual network operator, which means we don't, uh, until recently, own any towers. Um, instead, we lease capacity on towers and then we run our own network on top of it. We're different than Mint Mobiles of the world in that we insist on building all the software that runs the network. So it's all cloud based, it's a huge, gnarly software stack to run a telco, and we use that footprint then to build our features and functionality. Um, so to start with, it's just like, it, you know, we're 25 million into it. Um, by the time I got, I became our first subscriber a month ago. Um, so we needed a lot of money. The, the things I did well, um, I would say in the fundraising is number one, all of our early investors were people that I knew. I, luckily I knew some West Coast investors because I was an independent board member uh, for a great company called Manavar Labs. And so uh, Catherine Boyle who was at General Catalyst, now at Andrews and Horowitz. Greg Sands at Costa Noa um, are both uh, early investors in Cape, and I knew well from our board work, and so I trusted them and had a good relationship with them. Ross Fubini, our third early investor at XYZ, um, was an early check in Palantir and an early check in Andrel, and sort of in the community of people that I know and trust well. And so I certainly have um, more folks looking over my shoulder um, as a result of taking on all that money, but at least they're people that I know and like and trust, and that, um, that has helped significantly. And the last thing I'll say, um, just sort of echo, um, we didn't form a board until the series B. So in March, April this year, we closed our B, took my first board member. Um, and it was actually none of the people I just mentioned. It was Kevin Hartz at A Star Capital. Kevin had been a successful two time CEO before getting into investing. And I really valued having operators on the board and making sure people understood the kind of visceral pain of trying to do a startup and, and everything that that means, um, being the ones that had actual direct control over the company. Um, so those are the things I think I did well. <laughs> Got it. I mean, sixty million dollars is a robust amount of capital. How much do you think you'll eventually need to raise? I hope no more. Uh, I think, you know, we're, we're live now, and we, we um, knock on wood, we have a good plan to um, potentially never raise again. You know, we, there are a bunch of reasons we might want to. We have big shots we want to take, but uh, the core business, I think, is done. Got it. 
And just to, on that point, I, I don't want to leave the impression that raising a lot of venture capital is a bad idea, right? Um, I think the main point is raise as much as you need to get to that market proof points, right? In your case, it's capital intensive, right? We're a SaaS company, our costs are mainly labor, right? Um, when you get to that inflection point where you're beginning to own significant parts of the market, jam it on right? Uh, just really cover the market. And then you can be a big winner, right? Taking 150 million might sound like a lot, but not if you're exiting at 2 billion, right? So these are matters of scale. Yeah. hundred um, percent. Let me ask you guys, I'm curious, um, you know, if you look at just kind of talking a little bit about raising money. I mean, I, I, you learn a lot when you go through that process, right? As a, as an entrepreneur, um, there's, you know, but just by a show of hands, who all here has has ever raised venture capital? Uh, okay, so good good number of people. Um, yeah, I mean, there's like this thick like sort of set of documents. If you you're curious or want to have a hard time falling asleep, you can go to the NV you know NVCA, uh, which is the um, the Venture Capital Association, and they have all these model documents online, and you can kind of look at them. But in there, there's you know basically the result of um, you know, literally like 80 years of really smart people deal making and all the different, you know, machinations of that. And, and, um, and so it's a, it's a big learning curve. It, it is a walk, I think, as an entrepreneur, that's quite a bit different than creating like an integrator that maybe sells to the government or, which is a wonderful way of, by the way, creating a hundred person integrator and, and having that get acquired by Raytheon and never selling any money or never raising any capital at all is a wonderful way to be an entrepreneur as well. It's just a very different walk. But I guess, can you guys talk a little bit about that walk in general and some of the lessons, you know, maybe about managing your board or some of the things that have come from it? And then how would you imagine if we wanted to, because it seems to me like, again, this is selfishly from a venture perspective, that's a thing in this area. While, while we have a, a really dominant number of people that are amazing cyber professionals on a per capita basis in this region, we have, we don't have as many people that ha really understand that product walk, both raising money, product management, commercial sales and marketing, some of those things that go into that. And, and if that's an area where it's the, the labor force around here is a little bit thinner. Just talk a little bit about your kind of experiences there. Some of the lessons learned in that kind of venture oriented, high growth product company, the mindset, some of the things people should be aware of. Um, it's a great question. I think in general, when it's time to raise money, the thing that I try to keep in mind is that uh, venture capitalists, number one, are human, but number two, um, are fundamentally gamblers, right? Their, their model is to take a lot of bets and try to, for them, beating the house means that one in 10 hits. Um, and so that's, those are long odds and they need to see big winners. And, and what that means by my assessment to that personality type is uh, they want and need to be inspired when you're pitching them. Like they, they, uh, the way I've found is successful to get, especially early venture checks is to get, uh, the investors excited, right? The numbers matter and you gotta kind of figure out what, you know, what your gross margins could be someday. Um, but fundamentally you're asking them to really believe that there's an enormous company that you're building. Um, and if you can do that successfully, um, then in my experience, you, uh, you can get money and maybe if you allow me there's like there's one uh lesson that i've learned from raising money that i share with everyone who will listen anytime and so this is a good forum um to do that which is should you ever decide to start a company and take on venture funding and go out and uh and get a bunch of investors excited and be ready to um to close around there may came, there may come a moment when the big checks have settled and everyone is fighting for allocation and there's a whole class of venture investors who sort of hangs around the rim and wants to follow once the round is firming up. And so people will be asking about allocation. Here's the thing I learned and that I tell everyone. Uh, it's a, apparently a tried and true tactic um, to make that process personal, <laughs> to make the, the fighting over allocation feel like an emotional um, conversation from the investor's perspective. And they will act hurt or they, you know, they're, they're, there's a whole bag of tricks. And it was really, I had a sort of inebriated VC tell me one time after a round had closed and she didn't get the allocation that she wanted, um, that that is just a, a, a switch that she flips on when it's time to close the deal. And <laughs> it, it's actually like entirely an act. And it was so illuminating to me because I literally lost sleep uh, in the first couple of rounds, maybe wondering like, 
are these investors' feelings going to be hurt? Are people going to be mad that I cut them out of this round? And um, in reality, um, they're they're business people just like the rest of us, and they're trying to make money, and they have a specific way of doing it. Um, so anyway, uh, it's just something to keep in mind when dealing with investors. But in general, if you can inspire them, and if you, the vision is big enough, and the company, um, if, if it goes right, the company is enormous. Um, that's the most important story to be able to tell. Honestly, I wish I had the problems John has. Yeah, people fighting it. People fighting to get into my round. Can't relate, dude. Uh, so, uh, look, when it comes to early, early stage companies, it's hard to find venture capital. Um, there's not as much venture and venture capital as people like to think. Um, I think most venture capitalists are. Um, going for return, obviously, and the more sure the return, the more likely you're to find more, more people at the table. Uh, the people who really will invest early stage, they know that you don't have the product. They know that your vision is going to change. They know the market's going to change. It really comes down to, do they believe in you as a person, right? So they're betting on you. They're betting on your team. They're betting on your experience to, to navigate the difficult waters you're, you're going to be in. Um, and so those are, those are the important people, right? And those are the people you have to trust. And my, my only advice is find people that understand the market you're selling to. Um, if they haven't, you know, built companies, if they haven't successfully scaled companies or invest in companies in that particular space, they're not going to be able to give you meaningful help. Right. And, and then they're working from spreadsheets. Let's look at the numbers this past quarter, right? Um, and why aren't you selling more, right? That typically not a helpful conversation in a, in a board meeting, but one, one you're always going to have board meetings and investors and board members in general should be about solving problems together collaboratively. So, um, yeah, I, I haven't had to hurt any feelings so far, so I'm happy there. All right. So um, I want to make sure we have a little bit of time for some Q&A. And so this will just sort of be our, our kind of last concluding sort of question for you guys. So, so I'll ask for two things. Just if you had a, again, tried and true question, but sort of good nonetheless, if you had a magic wand, could do anything, is there one thing you would change in the DC area about the ecosystem? Uh, and then one just sort of personal recommendation, something you like, a restaurant activity, something in the DC area you like that you might, that might be a little off the beaten path that you can recommend to people as a takeaway. I'll give you one of my recommendations. I don't know if anybody has ever, if you guys have been to the National Cryptologic Museum, it's attached to NSA. It's uh, maybe one of my very favorites. Uh, it's the only museum I'm a member of, uh, but I, uh, yeah, that would be my recommendation. If you haven't been there, check it out. It's a really good museum. John. Um. I'm really nervous now that my my don't hurt feelings story came across as like exceedingly arrogant. And I, and I, <laughs> <laughs> that was not my, <laughs> yeah, I heard everyone's here feeling. No, I, I apologize if that's the way that that uh, landed. It comes only from my own like susceptibility to uh, appearing to hurt people's feelings. So, um, if I had a magic wand, what would I change about the DMV? I'll tell you. So we're a we're an in person company. Um, we have an office in Roslyn, and we. Um, we really value concentration of energy and collaboration. Um, and so we're, we're an in-person culture and an in-person uh, company. What was interesting is we wound up having to open a New York office um, because while there's an, an exceptional amount of talent in Washington, D.C., across a broad swath of areas, there are certain, um, certain pockets that we just couldn't hire for. For example, mobile development. It was really hard to build. In fact, I would argue maybe impossible uh, or harder than it needs to be to build a talented a mobile development team uh, in the DC area. And so that caused us to open in New York. So if I had a if I had a magic wand, I would move my entire existing team to DC and then make it possible to continue to scale, especially the technical team on a go forward basis. If I had a recommendation, um, I mean, I'll tell you, I'll tell you where my favorite place in Washington DC is. It's at the National Cathedral. And it's the, I don't even know, I should know this, I don't even know what it's called, but there's a fountain on the sort of north side of the, uh, of the National Cathedral uh, it's just beautiful and, it, and it's sort of um, on the side of the cathedral that no one visits when they're going to, to, to visit the actual thing. And if you go, there's Open City, um, which has a place in Woodley, but also has a smaller cafe at the cathedral that's a little bit under the radar too. And it's this beautiful sort of barn um, where you go and you order your bagel. 
and I go with my kids and then uh, you go sit by that fountain. It's just like a beautiful, serene spot in the middle of a really busy city. So I'd highly recommend it. Cool. Cool. So magic wand. Um, it's interesting. So uh, one of the events that we sponsor in the space that we sell to has peer groups. And I'm sure you guys might know peer groups. It was a kind of a new thing for me, but basically the CEOs of the companies that we sell to get together on a quarterly basis and we get to sponsor their, their nice dinners and so on. But what I learned from talking to them is how much they benefit from those peer groups. They sit in the round tables. They actually open books. It's amazing. Like, here's how we did last quarter. Here are the things that we signed up to do the next quarter. Here's our activities. And, and they organize the peer groups by size. So people in one peer group are the same stage company. And there's a whole maturity table model for these companies as they grow up to you know, they do it by EBITDA, basically. Uh, typically not competitors. Yeah, they're not in the same region. Yeah, so that, that's a good point. But look, I would love if I could wave my magic wand and say, let's have a CEO or, or leader peer group in the DC area for cybersecurity companies so we can learn from each other. Mostly, we, we don't compete against each other anyway, Matt, right? So, and we kind of started this, some, some of my uh, cyber noshers in the room here, we started this a few years ago with Pascal and some other folks. Uh, and we just got together a couple of times a year for dinner here in DC. And every time we have that, everyone like walks around, wow, that was amazing. It's just dinner and conversation. But imagine if we're a little more organized, like what did you do to scale? Like where'd you find your product management lead? And how are you going to market? What were your lessons learned? And I spent 70,000 at Black Hat and I only got 10 leads. That was terrible. Right? How do we how do we do better? Right? I mean, those are the kinds of things that can you can really learn and and really help you grow as a person as well as your business. So that's my magic wand. Uh, if anyone Matt wants to raise your hand and help turn DMV Rising into a peer group, that'd be awesome. Um, place. So I live on the Eastern Shore. That's across the bridge. If you don't know, it's not the beach. There's the Eastern Shore of the Chesapeake, and then there's the beach further east. Right. So. Uh, Beautiful area, highly recommend it. There's a there's a place in Cambridge, Maryland, which is on the way to Ocean City, if anyone's been there. Um, Blackwater National Wildlife Refuge, yes. Um, and then there's a really nice museum there, the Harry Tubman Museum. I, hmm. Yeah, you guys have been there. So anyway, that's one of my favorite places to take people. It's a, it's a really peaceful walk. Go in the early spring, the bird migration is unreal. So. All right, very cool. So, um, First of all, thank you guys very much. But but let's let's do a couple questions. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Back there. So uh, I go to uh, uh, conferences like Dotus and other intelligence community conferences. I was up in uh, uh, Tyson's Corner looking at uh, blueprint, the whole blueprint that was all in that no more, but the, the blueprint diagrams for secure facilities. And I'm seeing all these physical measures that I think technology should have solved by now. So when I go to these conferences, I ask that it seems like from my point of view, and like I'm just a small segment of the government, but I do work with you know the uh, the aspects of like NSA, the IC very closely on both the uh, informational, industrial, physical, and technical side. So I'm well Jedi in all those. I like to say I'm a jack of all those. The things that I don't see from industry, so I'm just giving you ideas, is solutions, electronic solutions to physical problems, not so much with networking, but trust is such a big thing in the government. We want to keep the information inside and not let it go outside. And electronically, they're doing that many, many ways. Uh, you just, a month ago, there was a real bad thing with computer security. I'm not going to mention the camp campaign anybody here, but it shut down a bunch of airports because they got a bad crash. You know what I'm talking about? And a mistake like that will happen when you're rushing things. Here's what I would say. If you built it, it will come. The tools that we need today, I think, are solutions for a building to have 100% control of RF Wi-Fi 
smart things for like you cannot buy a device that's going into a building that's not part of the internet of things to connect what if there was a tool or some kind of thing that we could be designed by industry uh, that could affix to a smart tv to make it oh it works but it's dumb it's not going to try and connect to anything and perimeter blocking like uh you've heard of white noise generators that block sound what about radio frequency, Wi-Fi, the opposite of what you guys are trying to do? You're trying to be that kind of money and get everything. What if it was a technical solution that would save millions of dollars on facility renovations that could isolate communications? Well, I know there's new things like you hear with Wi-Fi, you know, it can't like, can escape through a wall. Anyway, I'm just planning to see. I thought you're hearing from the other side of how it's hard to get into government to get. You know, I have to get a big fish. And what I'm saying from my point of view, it seems like everybody's doing the same thing, just a little bit better. So is the, is the question, how how do we create sort of meaningful progress in cyber? How do you take, uh, not, not necessarily, I guess you'll make the question, I'm sorry, I was, I was, I was, I was, I was uh, the question is, how do the newest ideas, right? get made and instead of everybody replicating others how do you come up with a new idea i think he, i'm answering my own question is you go to the source you ask him what do they need we need electronic security for physical solutions that are okay got it so in the spirit of time i would love these guys perspective on this um so just kind of taking a, a riff on that question and, and we are limited on time so it's going to have to be pretty quick but in your guys, how do you guys generate new ideas uh, and and sort of make sure the best ideas bubble to the top in your companies? Yeah, can I quickly maybe recommend an article that our investor, uh, Greg Sands, his firm just put uh, on the Coast and website, um, arguing if you want to do business with the government in particular and solve these kinds of big, hard, um, new or new thinking problems, um, you need to be focused on and the investors need to be focused on what they're calling uh, problem market fit rather than product market fit. Like if I build that for you, if I build this skiff that is a push button cloaking device and all the rest, uh, it's going to cost a lot of money. And it's not clear that I, like I get to get to product market fit uh, before I go out and raise money. And so to start thinking in terms of problem market fit, like this is an enormous problem and it's an enormous market. And uh, my idea is so, so good that if we build it, um, it's a foregone conclusion that I can replace all the skips with my magic cloaking device would be an example of problem market fit. It's at least, in my opinion, a more evolved way of thinking um, by the investors about dual use or even single use, meaning defense only technologies. Really good blog post. All right, so thank you very much. I, unfortunately, we are out of time for this panel. Uh, Anoop and John, thank you guys very much. This was an enjoyable conversation. All right.